Professor, last time we spoke about the AAA game industry and the reasons for people's growing resentment of them. What are your thoughts on the state of AAA game development? It is a hot mess. Words almost escape me. Is it really as bad as that? Not really. I'm over-dramatizing, but it is not in good shape. Look at a few examples of what I mean. The most recent in people's minds is Mass Effect Andromeda. It had a rather small budget for a AAA game, only $40 million. The problem here wasn't the cost of development, but the apparent lack of quality control. I remember viewing all of the face animation memes. Lack of QA I think is probably the number one problem with AAA development. At least as it stands now with the biggest of the AAA studios. I detect that this is not the only issue. If it were, fixing what's wrong would be easy. It isn't even the ballooning budgets for most AAA games that's the problem. Is it a problem with the developers, Professor? No, the problem is easily traced to one source. Management. It isn't the programmers, artists, and game designers who make the big decisions, but the management staff. Ultimately, whether a game gets an expansion, DLC, or patches is the decision of management. All of the decisions made by AAA Game Studios for the past few years that infuriates gamers has all been made by the higher-ups in the company. Day 1 DLC and patches season passes, the addition of microtransactions for single-player games, overpriced collector's editions that do not include a copy of the game, no player-controlled dedicated servers, a lack of local and local area network multiplayer. The programmers don't decide these things, the management staff does. They control the budget for a given project, and set milestones and deadlines for the developers to meet. Often these projects have tight schedules, and that leaves little room for things like, oh, I don't know, maybe QA testing, among other things. I have assimilated many pages of horror stories about the atrocious working conditions of electronic arts. That is because of the tight deadlines. The turnover is rather high at companies like Electronic Arts, stress levels are high, and people burn out rather quickly. This is because people aren't treated like people, but corporate assets. Why do you think they call it human resources? Combine all these things together. This is why AAA game studios are in the state they're in today. Why even big budget titles are shipping with bugs that should have never passed even basic QA testing. This doesn't even include the decision to milk popular franchises until they're dead. Mass Effect, Dead Space, Assassin's Creed, Call of Duty, Battlefield, Batman Arkham, all of them are dead or dying. Mass Effect and Dead Space we know are dead. But Batman Arkham is still up in the air. As for the other three, EA, Activision, and Ubisoft had no choice but to shift directions or see their cash cow franchises crash and burn. It remains to be seen if Call of Duty and Assassin's Creed can be saved. I have been analyzing all of the data you have presented, Professor. So what is your conclusion? Greed is killing the AAA game studios. And how did you come to that conclusion? In past episodes, you stated that many AAA game studios have people in upper management who have had no prior experience in the gaming industry. These people come from the retail space or the fast food industry where the business philosophy is very different. To summarize, they treat video games like a throwaway commodity rather than art. This is evidenced by the yearly release schedules for the biggest franchises. The rapid development lack of quality assurance testing, and a lack of real innovation and gameplay between releases. 
What this means is AAA studios are less concerned with making the best games possible, but are more focused on shipping the most games possible, then exploiting their most loyal fanbase with DLC and microtransactions for the life of the game, which tends to be one to two years. By denying gamers dedicated servers and restricting mod support they can control the lifespan of a game to incentivize buying the next game in the series. It is a known statistic that the majority of profits for franchises like Call of Duty and Battlefield comes from a small portion of the Avil gaming community. As such, these franchises are so expensive to develop that they must turn a profit every release in order for the companies making them to avoid bankruptcy. A failure by one or both major franchises would send ripples throughout the entire gaming industry. The collapse or near collapse of Electronic Arts or Activision would harm consumer confidence. This is what caused the video game crash of 1984, a significant drop in consumer confidence due to a series of conditions which have parallels in the video game market today. It is unrealistic to suggest a second crash is impossible. People are too blinded by the widespread proliferation of video games to see the dangers that exist. Conditions exist today for a second but less devastating crash. Back in 1984, it took a glut of garbage games and the failure of Atari's E.T. game to trigger the crash. The catalyst which causes a second crash could ironically be the slow death of video game content on YouTube due to the advertising controversy. Game streaming is a major contributor to why video games are so popular today. That is why I say it is ironic. But that alone isn't the only reason. Every point you've brought up, I've been trying to warn people about, and they aren't listening. Well, there are those who are. But it isn't enough to make a difference. Most everyone else is asleep at the wheel. That is why I do this, why I make this show, to raise awareness. What can we do to resolve all of this, Professor? First, stop insisting a second crash can't happen. Current conditions in the industry say otherwise, so just stop and accept that it is likely. Pay attention to what is actually happening in the gaming market and not on what you're being told by mainstream gaming media and marketing campaigns. Now, with that said, here is how we change things. Have the courage and self-control to invest your money in games from companies who have business practices you agree with. Maybe it is best that EA, Activision, and or Ubisoft fail. That sounds bad, but maybe as we've both said, a second crash is likely not to be as devastating as the first. I mean, look at the dot-com bubble of the 90s, and how the internet has rebounded since then. Same would be true for a second video game crash. The market would rebound because we have something today the gaming industry didn't have back then. What is that, Professor? Only a few companies were releasing good games, while the rest were pumping out barely playable garbage just to make a quick buck. What about asset flips? Isn't that the same thing? Yes it is. But back then we didn't have the internet. Video game reviews from honest non-mainstream sources and reviews on services like Steam and Amazon. Yes, there were video game magazines. But unlike today, we didn't have so many differing opinions being shared. So we really had no way of knowing if a game was any good until we got it home. We also have indie developers who aren't afraid to innovate, try new ideas, and if a crash were to happen, they'd likely be the ones to weather it the best. We have indie developers like CD Projekt Red who outclassed the AAA studios with their Witcher series. They aren't alone. Some indie studios who were small frys a few years ago have grown to become mini AAAs. Yes, they're still flexible, willing to take risks on innovative IPs. How many brand new IPs have we seen from the big AAA studios? Not many. 
So, how do we change the gaming industry? The answer is simple. Rather than complain in forums or on Reddit, we make our voices heard using our wallets. Money is the only language these people understand, and we have the power to send them a powerful message. Have the courage to stand up the peer pressure. Return objections from your friends with pressure of your own. We aren't powerless. That's a fable we've been told since we were born. Gamers are consumers, and it is the consumers who drive the market, not the big corporations. Without our money, they are the ones who are powerless. This is the truth they don't want you to know. This isn't limited to the gaming industry. This applies everywhere. A well-informed consumer scares the hell out of the corporate types in Wall Street. Well said, Professor. I have a few announcements to make this episode. First, I'm going to be in a new show over on the Zort Central channel on Bidme. The show is called Game Shame, a show which highlights the shortcomings of games and game developers and gives positive advice on how to fix those shortcomings. Also, we're experimenting with the source filmmaker for making episodes of this series. Additionally, there will be two episodes of Chloe and the Professor each month, more live streams of Elite Dangerous and other games, and there will continue to be guest videos from our partners over at Gamers Bay. I'd also like to extend our best wishes to our friends impacted by the recent hurricanes in the Gulf region. Our thoughts go out to you, and I urge everyone here in Zort Central and everyone watching in the Gamers Bay community to help out in whatever way you are capable. Please stay safe. And thanks for watching. <laughs>